All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us here for our second corporate forum. Uh, very excited to introduce Dr. John Kim, who will be leading us through this lecture. Uh, with that, I know Dr. Kim, you've got a full presentation, so I'll just kick it over to you. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Matt, and uh, I want to thank the whole Snow Aces medical team: Randy, Eric, Tiana, Lauren, Connor, anyone that I left out. Uh, it's truly a pleasure working with this outstanding team. I also want to thank all the attendees here. Um, and wow, what a presentation by Dr. Levitt. He really did a great job. And as I am not nearly as tall as that giant, I probably will be standing up here most of the time to see what it feels like to be a Curry Levitt. So here's my family. You know, everything in my life revolves around family, especially when I'm not at work or doing lectures like this. And my wife is actually a non-practicing dentist, more so a full-time mother. And I have to thank her a lot as she has really um, gotten good at taking intro photograph uh, photos. And she has actually taken many of the pictures that you'll see today. And my working family, um, can't thank them enough. I always believe that you know teamwork makes a dream work. And they really work hard to help us deliver outstanding patient care. And I'm um, very fortunate to also practice with my very close friend, uh, Dr. Harriet Arrington. So since we are in Arizona, and I do love football, I thought I'd share this. I don't know if any of you remember this play, but this was to win the game last second. Over three defenders, D-Hop caught that ball to win the game against the heavily favored Bill, and that was miraculous, okay? And miracles are amazing. I mean, they're fun to witness, but what are the issues with miracles? I mean, they're rare. They don't happen often. And what I want to make sure is that when we talk today about bio exclude is that I want to focus on everyday dentistry, nothing with heroic dentistry, nothing with herodontics. I want to focus on getting good, predictable, regenerative therapy with this membrane. So though today's corporate forum will focus on the dental application of BioExclude, okay, um, it's neat to know that this has been here in the, with the medical application for many, many years. And this is especially personally, uh, personal to me because I've had a medical scare myself. And what I thought was really neat is to see the spinal application of BioExclude. So here I am in 2015 after three years of failed physical therapy. Um, it was really hard to deal with the nerve pain I had in my neck and in my hands. Now, the only good thing about all this was that I was very fortunate not to have any motor deficiencies. Um, so what was done here is my neurosurgeon went in through the back of my neck, did a posterior foraminotomy to help open up some of the nerve space so that I could hopefully get some relief with the chronic pain I've been dealing with. Unfortunately, it did not work out. I still had symptoms. Life was honestly miserable, and so went in with the anterior approach. And this time, what happened was they actually removed the two discs that were compressing my nerve and put in some artificial discs at the C5, C6, C6, C7 level. Well, it's a very technique-sensitive procedure from my understanding, and you can see that the end plates of the artificial disc replacement surgery is off midline. And if you look at the image at the far right, okay, what you'll see is you'll get to see some osteolytic lesions within my spine. And you could see, if you look closely, that it doesn't look like there has been integration of the end plate with my spine as well. And worse off than just what these images show here is that my symptoms were still not better. After speaking to a lot of medical experts, I was very blessed and lucky to uh, have Dr. Daniel Rue work on me. He's a world-renowned spinal surgeon. Actually works on a lot of athletes, especially a lot of UFC fighters who deal with spine issues. And what he did was he went ahead and removed my artificial discs. Okay? So here they are removed, and this is how I stand today, looking like the bionic man at least where my neck is. I had a fusion done, two levels, and they put in some BMP. So why do I share this? It's not just to 
have you focus on proper ergonomics or, you know, pacing yourself the right way. But had I known more about BioExclude and its medical application earlier on, I would have begged and begged my surgeon who did it in 2015 and 16 to give it a chance because I've seen the benefits or heard about the benefits with its nerve application. So here's that smiley face that I will be talking about, okay? It's BioExclude. It's truly unique. There's not another barrier membrane out there that will offer the biological advantages that you see here. Okay, you got the growth factors, which can always help with the healing process. It's immunoprivileged. And what you'll see throughout today's cases is that you will see a lot of accelerated early healing. And hopefully you'll see, because what I try to do with a lot of my cases is try to show the end results. And what you'll see with my documentation is that you do get really good bone using BioExclude. And you'll see the positive effect it has on keratinized tissue. Also, what's really unique about it is that this barrier membrane also has antimicrobial properties. So before we talk more about BioExclude, let's talk about the amnion chorion, just do a very quick overview. Okay, the amnion chorion, which is what BioExclude is made from, is taken from the placenta in consenting mothers that are having C-section procedures. It's the avascular tissue layer that separates the mother from the fetus with the amnion being closest to the fetus and the chorion being closest, closer to the mama. And you may see it out there. You may see it out in the exhibition that there are other amnion-only membranes. There are other amnion-chorion membranes available. And the thing is, is that when there is success with something, anything in life, you know, it sort of becomes like a copycat league, okay? And what's important to understand is that BioExclude is unique through its proprietary purion processing. Okay? In a very simplistic explanation here, I'll go into it. Okay? What you have is, is you have the epithelial layers removed from the amnion, and you have it removed from the chorion. So we expose the basement membrane. Okay? And this is the big reason why, as you've seen in many of Curry's cases, that there is not a side specificity or orientation issue with it. That smiley face can be placed up or down. It does not matter. In addition to the epithelial layers being removed, okay, what you're also going to do is you're going to remove that spongy intermediate layer that's between the amnion and chorion. And through the careful processing, what's going to happen is that the amnion and chorion layers are going to be laminated together, and voila, we have our bioexclude. And as bioexclude has you know, many different applications. It's really important for it to come in many different sizes, okay? And this is pretty neat. This is actually a photo from the back of the box, which I find to be, you know, very helpful that you have a life-size diagram that shows the actual size sizes of the membranes that you have available. So when I'm doing a surgery, I ask my assistant to bring over the box, flip it over, let me take a look, and I could easily choose anything as small as 8x8 and something as large as 20 by 30 to use for that procedure. It depends on what procedure you're doing. And this is probably the best way I think of bioexclude. Like Curry, I'm more of a wet-handed periodontist. We're up here speaking occasionally. I don't do nearly as much as he does. But um, most of the time, I'm in the office treating a variety of cases. And all the procedures that you see on the right are procedures that BioExclude can work with, thus making this a very versatile membrane and what I feel like as the Swiss Army knife of barrier membranes. So are you ready for some cases? And um, Tiana, sorry, it's not your favorite Game of Thrones uh, visual here. But um, I don't know about you, but this is when I'm driving to work, this is sometimes what I feel like. I have no clue what's going to come at me, good or bad. Um, it's crazy, but trust me, I feel blessed. I love my job, but um, my goodness, um, it can get hectic at times. So this is actually my very, very first case doing an extraction. 
site preservation with BioExclude. And the reason why I want to show this is I want to show you how I use BioExclude. So this tooth is non-restorable, has to be removed. And I'm probably going to come down here so I can see better. And this handle is different than other barrier membranes, okay? You want to, a lot of times you're hydrating, hydrating the membrane beforehand. You don't do that with BioExclude. You get it while it's dry, so I use a dry forcep, bring it over to the site, okay? That bone graft, with it being wet, will help hydrate that membrane and literally just suck it down. It'll suck it down, and if you don't have enough hydration, all you do is get a monoject syringe, or you get a micropipette, and add some more sterile saline to it, adaptive membrane is needed, and if you accidentally have too much moisture in the area, get that magical white thing called the gauze, dampen it, and you could further manipulate the bio exclude to the defect in the bone graft. So here it is clinically with the bio exclude in place, and here's an occlusal view of it, well adapted. Did I have to flap this open? I try to keep everything atraumatic as possible. But like I said before, this is my very first case, and I wanted to make sure that I know how to use this properly. There is a learning curve in using this, but once you get used to it, like most things in life, practice makes uh, perfect. You could, uh, you could perfect things, and it really is an easy barrier membrane to use. So I tend to over-suture, and I overdid it here. I mean, what do I have here? My goodness, I got a horizontal mattress, I got two simple interruptors, and I got a reverse figure eight suture. When in reality, this is all you really need, okay? It's a reverse figure eight suture. The beauty of this is it's easy to do. You go from internal to external when you tag the flap, and when you do that, there's a low chance of you nicking the membrane because what's more of a headache than when you get that membrane perfectly set and then it moves out of place and you're cursing in your head? Well, if that happens, don't worry. Just go ahead and get your micro elevator of your choice. Make sure it's damp, wet, and go ahead and tuck that membrane back in place. I mean, it's really, really easy to adapt back. So initial healing is accelerated, and that's what I see here at one week post-op, and that's what I see with the majority of my cases when I use BioExclude. Here we are four months out, uneventful healing, good care, nice tissue, and let's see what we, look, what we have at re-entry. At re-entry at four months, we have good quantity of bone, we have good quality of bone, and when you have those two together, it makes it very, for a very simple implant surgery. And it's all about improving the predictability of any therapy we do. So here's a case I can't show a follow-up, but I want to show you how I use it. Sweet, sweet lady. She lives in Rocky Mount half the year. I do not know why when she lives in Italy the other half of the year. And so her being gone for a long time, I want to make sure that I have something that will have the least chance of having a healing complication and have some faster healing because I'm not going to be able to see her for another couple months. So here it is. I wanted to show how to use it. It's not as fan. I don't have the cool sounds like Dr. Levitt there. I got to ask him how he does all that stuff. But um, the membrane is just easily adapted. You just go ahead and add some more sterile sealing and get a dampened gauze, and you could go ahead and just further manipulate it very easily, and it conforms to the graft and extends easily onto the native bone. There was a powdal defect, so. I know you may see in that flyer that, you know, it just needs to go one millimeter sub G. I mean, my recommendation is that depends on the defect. I had a palatal defect, so I'm not going to go one millimeter sub G. I'm going to go extend past it and make sure it's extended on the native bone. So, again, I have the peace of mind knowing that I'm not going to see her for a while, but I feel very confident that I'm not going to have, or she's not going to have complications while she's gone for a couple months. So I showed you cases where I flapped it, but I really strive my best to keep things minimally invasive. Tooth, vertical root fracture, non-restorable, needs to be extracted, tooth taken out, flapless procedure, slight palatal bone loss, got my bone graft in there, cortical cancellus, my ratio di differs, most of the time it's one to one, but it depends on the defect and what type of barrier function membrane I'm using. And I use a simple reverse figure eight suture, and, 
you know, I challenge you to have these patients come back and see how great the healing looks early on, especially even four days post-op. Not going to do this in, to all my patients, but I wanted to see, and she was willing to. Four months out, good care, nice tissue, and at re-entry, again, when you have good bone, it makes it for a very quick and straightforward implant surgery. And this is what I want to really focus on right here, is this is a huge advantage you have with this barrier membrane, is that it can be left intensely exposed. So what you have here is in a study on blood agar plates, you have bioexclude discs, you also have some other amnion chorion um, membranes, and I think you also have a collagen membrane here. And what this shows here is an antibacterial effect that you could witness by seeing the zone of inhibition here. I mean, you, don't, you only get it in bioexclude, and look at how much you get here. And so it's nice to be able to not only leave a membrane exposed, but, you know, when you have a surgery, whether it's in your colon, your foot, mouth, wherever, the two things you worry about are bleeding and infection. It's nice to have a barrier membrane with antimicrobial properties to not have to worry about that as much. So BioSlude has really helped me reduce my chair side time, and, you know, why not try to simplify things, okay? Don't make, you know, procedures too challenging. I love using this um, simple WAM key. Easily removes the crown or bridge or whatever on, is on there. It makes it quicker for sectioning the tooth. The other thing it does is that when you section a tooth that has a restoration on it, it leaves a lot of debris, so it just takes more time to clean all that out, and it's a big pain in the butt. After the crown is removed, proceed with just my usual divide and conquer, flapless procedure, keeping it atraumatic, maintain buccal lingual bone, and also maintaining the furcal bone. Put in my 50-50 uh, cortical cancellus mix, put in my bioexclude that easily adheres to the graft. And what's different about this than the previous cases is that this is a molar site. It's a larger site. So it being a larger site, let's put in two reverse figure eight sutures. And my favorite part about this, and I get this regularly, is this. That is good, natural-looking bone. I ask you to look close as you can and see if you could see any residual bone graft particles. Okay? We have good bone turnover. And when we have good bone turnover, good quality bone like this, all it does is improve the survival rate of that implant over time. And that's what it's all about. So not every... Um, um, as every defect um, warrants a different entry time, that one, since it had all the bony walls present, not much of a defect, just four months. Yep. And, you know, bioexclude has a barrier function of eight, you know, to 12 weeks. I wish every case could be as simple as some of the ones I've just shown, but the reality of uh, what you see in the office is you're going to get a mix of everything, including more challenging cases. And you can see here there's a fistula, number nine. These two teeth need to come out. Elderly gentleman, 96 year old, and he needs two implants. Significant medical history. It's on Plavix, it's on aspirin. You know what I'm thinking? Number one, I want to refer this to Dr. Levitt, okay? And two, make sure that thing's working, okay? Because, look, it makes me nervous when I get an elder gentleman in. But in all seriousness, the reason why I'm bringing up this case is because, look, he's not a teenage kid, okay? I want anything that could help me with biologics and enhancing the whole wound healing process to allow us to speeding up the healing, because time's probably not on his side either, okay? And also have better healing. I want to minimize complications as much as I can here. And what we know is, is through studies, and I think this is an older slide, is that I think there's well over 250 soluble growth factors in this barrier membrane. I mean, that is just awesome. Here we are in my ver little cool surgery, moving the teeth atraumatically. Always practice atraumatic extractions. But even though I kept this as a flapless procedure, I knew what the CT scan showed. I knew that I was missing a lot of bone underneath. 
And you can see it right here. And if you look on the facial, the whole facial plate's missing on number eight. And number nine, almost all of it's missing. I mean, actually, the hardest part about this procedure is when you degranulate, because that's very important, is I do not know how that small isthmus of bone on number nine still stayed in place. And here's the bio exclude in place. And the beauty of bio exclude is that if you were there watching this surgery, it was stressful because this patient bled and bled and bled and bled. I don't have time to fixate the membrane. I mean, I have to work fast. So it's, again, nice to have a biomaterial that I can use with great handling properties, something that will just suck down. It doesn't matter if it folds upon itself. It doesn't matter which side it goes on. It just, you know, when I'm in surgery, I don't like to think. I like to do. And that's what BioSlue allows me to do. So here we are. Didn't even attempt primary closure. Four days out because something was wrong with his Essex. I went ahead and took pics and see that initial healing looks great. Three weeks out, all sutures removed but the two horizontal mattress. And it's almost fully closed. And six months out, patient's still alive, and we have good soft tissue healing. And let's look at this CT scan. Got about seven, eight millimeters of width. That's plenty of bone to place two implants. You know, seeing the CT scan is one thing, but, you know, I always hold my breath until I see what the bone looks like clinically, and we have good bone here. And it makes it really easy for me to go ahead to, and again, this is a 96-year-old who had an extensive defect from two teeth, and we were able to predictably regenerate bone here for him to have two implants, and he's a happy guy. So what do all these cases have in common I showed so far? Is that, you'll notice, there's no primary closure. Well, guess what? No problem, okay? Whether you accidentally leave it exposed or whether it is intentionally left exposed, it's not much of an issue. I mean, we know about its antimicrobial property that you have with BioExclude. But, uh, hey, yikes. You're right. So. When you don't advance the tissue, we can maintain keratinized tissue. And we all know how important keratinized tissue is. And that's what you can do when you leave this membrane intentionally exposed. Let's look at this case on the right side here. You don't need a radiograph to see that that's a hot mess underneath that, okay? And I wish I could show the whole case. It's actually pretty neat. But if I show you the CT scan of that, when we did a um, bone graft at the time of the extraction, the bone looks great. But when we got amazing bone, because it's easy to get good bone when you have full coverage, right? But now we have a self-inflicted mucogingival defect, okay? Not many patients are too happy about having that additional procedure. Say, oh, by the way, now we got to fix this because we created this. I'm going to shift gears and talk about another big part of what I do in my private practice, and that's immediate implants. Here, a tooth with a resorption lesion needs to be extracted. There's a resorption lesion, tooth is out, implant is in a desirable, restorable position, and this is one of the earlier cases I've done with an immediate implant. Was a flap needed? No. You know, I just wanted to make sure I felt comfortable in using this. And if you've ever seen Dr. Dan Cullum talk, I mean, he shows some neat cases where he doesn't even have the cover screw in there. He has a healing abutment, leaves a bio in place, and you gain more keratinized tissue. So that's how I do it more often nowadays. Anyway, uh, like Dr. Levitt said, I will always graph the gap. I mean, it's so easy to do, and it comes with pretty much no risk in doing so. Get that smiley face out that has a lot of reason to smile for. Make sure it's dry. And the beauty about this is that, again, it's easy to use. It doesn't matter if it hugs the adjacent teeth root surfaces, okay? That's not going to matter one bit like you would have to worry about in a non-resorbable membrane. And here it is clinically. You know, it's rigid when it's dry, but once it gets hydrated, it just, it just sucks down and adapts and adheres very well 
to the bone graft, and to the native bone. So, like I mentioned earlier, you could have done this with a healing abutment. You didn't need to close it. I tried to close it. It's not even fully closed, but I'm not going to worry because it can be left exposed. One week out, looking good. And re-entry. This is a good problem to have. Too much bone. I don't mind going over on time when I have to do an uncovering. I always want to have too much bone. That's where we started. So I go ahead, start off with usually a high-speed handpiece, follow up with a back action chisel, and carefully remove the excess amount of bone. And here we are from beginning to end on this crown ready to deliver and patient in a much better situation after unfortunately losing that tooth here. Very predictable, very easy to do. So as bioexclude has been a, bi a big game changer in my private practice, so has IPRF and what's known as sticky bone, the whole concept of it. And I know the research is divided on whether or not you really get some true benefits with its regeneration. But I know one thing that is undeniable is the handling property is significantly improved. Okay? And we have to know how this can be helpful when you're using it with bioexclude. When I do ridge augmentation procedures, I will always have these two together. So let's go over a case here. There is thick bone here, but it's not in the right place. So if we're going to put a crown here, how can we place an implant there? We have to augment this ridge. And you follow the past principle, Anle Wong, in doing your GBR, get my intramural penetration, get more bleeding. But this is what I want to talk about, why we use sticky bone here, OK? With most traditional membranes, you will typically put the membrane first, bone graft second, okay? I mean, it depends on your style and how you like to proceed with it. But remember, with bioexclude, it's preferable to place the bone graft first. Well, what's in the mouth? You got saliva, you got bleeding going on, and that washes away all the graft particles, so it becomes a huge headache. So when I do these ridge augmentation procedures, and follow a different protocol of bioexclude, it's important for you, in my opinion, to use sticky bone. Place it over dry, let it suck down, looks like saran wrap, and it's adapted over to bone graft, and it must extend on to native bone. There it is in place with an occlusal view, and here we are throughout the healing process uneventful healing. And what I love about this is what you see in the far right. When you look at that osteotomy, you see a very clear and defined osteotomy. It's not, it doesn't have jagged edges. Because if you have jagged edges, that probably indicates that you didn't have full bone turnover. I got bleeding bone here. I got everything I want in an augmented ridge for predictable implant therapy. Implants easily put in place because we have good bone, healing abutment, and a crown that's placed that's um, just a hair off on the shade, um, not mine. Um, look, patient never complains, so. And here we are two years out, I believe. I can't remember the timeline on this, but what I like is good soft tissue. Look at the PA. Not only did we maintain good bone, but look how dense, you know, the crestal bone is in the cortication from this ridge augmentation procedure using a bioactive barrier membrane. So that was a case I used with just bioexclude. But what I, yes? Um, whether it's bioexclude or any barrier membrane, if I'm really trying to augment a deficient ridge with a ridge augmentation procedure, I will do my absolute best to not leave any exposed. It doesn't matter what membrane it is, in my opinion. So here's a case where 
This is what I use Bioxude a lot with is I use it in conjunction with another barrier membrane. And I love BioExclude, but one thing that you notice is as you use it more and more is that you're not going to get that space maintenance as good with BioExclude, I mean, just because of its, how thin it is. The other thing is, is that sometimes I need something with a longer barrier function. Why would I need it for something like this? I mean, you don't need a CT scan to see that that is a very deficient ridge, knife edged, right? So here we are clinically, you know, some say, well, just reduce the ridge, place a, a shorter implant, but you know, I think that leads to a lot of problems on its own. So I'd rather augment it because I feel comfortable and predictable in augmenting ridges. I'd rather get back the bone that I know I can get. Here's a clinical occlusal view of it. And you can see at best, maybe we have what, one, 1.5 millimeter of ridge crest. I mean, you can't even put a mini implant in there. So we're going to augment this. Follow all my basic GBR principles. When you have to augment a site this deficient, I always incorporate autogenous because it has the three qualities in a bone graft that I'd like. You know, osteogenic. It's going to be osteoconductive and osteoinductive. This being severely deficient, I added some hardware, I added some tenting screw. I wanted that additional scaffold to give myself every bit of chance of regenerating enough bone for this patient to have implant therapy. Do my decortication. If you're gonna do this, my advice is put in your tenting screw first and then do your decortication after. Get that good bleeding bone, get that sticky bone out, put it in place, and I got a longer lasting collagen membrane in there. This being the large defect, we got to get that graft membrane complex stable. So I put three periosteal stabilizing sutures to keep this in place. And since I have more hardware in this, I mean, so I sort of think of it like almost like when I'm treating a titanium reinforced membrane cases, what do we worry about? Exposure. Well, if I don't want to ha have any chance of exposure because I have some tenting screws in there and a big bone graft in there, I want to have something that could accelerate the soft tissue healing, which is why I layered the bioexclude over this longer lasting barrier membrane. And the beauty of this is that just like the bone graft, that is moist, that membrane, and it just sucks down and hugs it very easily. In order to get good primary closure, tension free, got to have the right flap design and get enough release. I always like to make sure I have horizontal mattress sutures in there to minimize tension at the flap margin. And here we are one week out good healing, three weeks out, all the sutures removed. Re-entry, I can't remember when, probably beyond six months, took out the screw and put in the implant. And again, from a ridge that was very deficient, maybe one, two millimeters max of bone, allowing us to go ahead and place an implant in there. This is becoming a bigger part of my practice, is guided surgery, okay? This case, this patient, sweet lady, drove, I think, two or three hours away to see me, had had 10 prior surgeries, okay? A lot of apicos, a lot of everything. I was on a call or a Zoom meeting with the dentist and the lab, and the plan was to do a flapless guided surgery. But when I look at the CT scan here, that's just way too radiopaque for me. Okay, so for me, I get a little bit concerned. Did we have bone turnover? And so even though flapless um, guided surgery was proposed, I just don't know how comfortable I feel with that. Okay? Uh-oh. Please don't freeze. Okay. So here we are. Guided surgery done. If I did this flapless and you're not experienced, maybe you leave the implant in there not knowing why it fails later. Okay, implant number 10, good bone around it. Implant number nine, yikes, we don't have enough, right? Got most of the implant threads exposed. Okay, this comes also with the patient who's had many, many surgeries, a lot of scar tissue, probably not as good as the vascular supply. Every reason for this maybe not to heal right. 
which gives me every reason to want to use a bioactive barrier membrane. Okay? And so I went ahead, and I wish I had a photo of this, but I put the bone graft in place, not even any autogenous, okay? I put in a layer of the bioexclude over the bone graft. Then I put a longer-lasting collagen membrane over that, and then I layered it again with bioexclude. Closed it, and six months out, I'm very happy with what I see in the CT scan, but that, to me, means nothing until I verify that clinically. And so we go in there clinically, and this is what I see. I had to record it just so no one would think I Photoshopped this, okay? Where is that implant? When you look at the right and you see how much of this was exposed, in a patient that had 10 surgeries beforehand, I felt a lot of pressure, her driving two, three hours away, for me to try to get this right for the patient. And that's the beauty of this, okay, is that we can get this good healing. You just got to think out loud, like, what's the best way to approach this? What surgical techniques? What biomaterials am I going to use? What's the history of this patient? What can we do to get her from point A to point B? I'm going to shift gears here, okay, to managing complications. As I do a lot of osteotome sinus lifts and sinus lifts in general, you're going to get perforations every now and then. Okay? And it's really not that big of a deal. And I say that now just because I have BioSlu to help me out. There it is. A little tear in the Schneiderian membrane. Okay? All you need to do is get that BioSlu out and let it suck down, and it would adhere well to the tear margins or beyond it. Now, one common mistake, and don't ask me how I know, that people make is that you go with a membrane too small. Always go big or bigger. Okay, you want to make sure that it is hearing beyond the tear margins at least a couple millimeters, more than that just to be safe. So did this stop me from completing the procedure and telling the patient, no, we've got to wait for this and do it later? No. I got that sinus membrane sealed, proceed with my osteotome, get the implant in there, and the patient has a crown. Again, managing a complication, very easy to do. So I was fortunate when I was in dental school that we were required to do two years of med school. I groaned at that time, but because at that time I didn't know I was going to go into perio. You go into perio. How many, patient, how many patients do you ever have in a day that come in with no medications, no medical history? I mean, they're going to have rheumatoid arthritis, be on medications for that, that compromise a whole wound healing cascade, higher chance of infection, or you get that diabetic or that smoker. There's always going to be something that you worry about with the healing potential. And that's where we really have to think about how can we use biologics to make sure we counteract some of these negative effects. So here's a case, for whatever reason, just to not heal well. You can see it on the CT scan. There's some voids in there. Okay, I was supposed to place an implant, but no. I mean, I removed that bone graft that did not turn over for whatever reason. Does that make me abort the procedure? No. I, de I just remove all the bone graft, make sure I get good sound bleeding bone, and this is actually easier to do an than an immediate implant in. Put that implant in place and get my bone graft in there and get my bioexclude to suck down and hug the graft. Get primary closure with glycolin sutures. And at reentry, this is a case where the patient didn't heal well initially, now able to have successful implant therapy. And that's what we had before. Okay? There's no reason we can't correct these type of issues. And here this patient is two years out, okay, maintaining good crustal bone and has excellent soft tissue he health. Look at the positive effect that we have with that keratinization in, that, in front of that implant. And this is because of the biologic properties that are inherent with bioexclude. You get amnion only. You only get, you don't get any, you get barely any growth factors in there. Well, you get that amnion only, but you go through the proprietary perion processing, and now you have 
a higher concentration. But we all know that the, how important the chorion layer is, okay? Because that, compo that has more than 80% of the growth factors, the cytokines, the chemokines, everything that we want to take advantage of the biologics in bioexclude. And that's what I think really helped me out in that last case and many cases that I do. So here's another case, very unhappy patient. GP did extraction site prez, probably saw the CT scan, said go to Dr. Kim, drove two hours of me, and I had to review the CT scan, and you could see that that bone just does not look good. And so this is another case, healing less than ideal. Well, let's fix it. Not only do we not have good bone for me to place an implant, but there is a defect now on a mesial of 14. And yes, I am a periodontist. So we're going to try to fix this. I'm going to get that implant in there, clean it out thoroughly, and you can see that defect right there. Also on a mesial 14. Implants in place. You can see a buccal concavity. I like to have a minimum of two millimeters buccal shelf of bone. Get my sticky bone out. Graft within the defect, in the graft the gap, also augment the facial, place on that bio exclude. And what I love about this photo here is that you got to make sure that bio exclude is extended on the native bone. And it does so easily. Get, near primar get primary closure, and the CT scan shows a very augmented ridge, good soft tissue healing and the good problem of spending extra time to remove that excess bone to unearth that cover screw so you could put on a healing abutment. Well, let's look at what we had before, okay? We corrected a few problems here, okay? When number one, we augmented that facial. Number two, we were able to easily graft the gap where there's like no good bone at all to begin with. And then also we improved number 14. That defect was grafted successfully. So again, Make sure you take advantage of the biologics. Understand the biology of what you're doing. So these numbers are staggering, but I believe it to be true. I mean, I have my own share of uh, implant complications, but I get a lot of referrals on failing implants. And so here you can see separation there. And I love it. When you go into the world of social media, how often do you see hashtag this is not my implant? It makes me feel like I'm the only one with failing implants. Um, but this case, you could see with the radiograph, it's not peri-implant mucositis. It's peri-implantitis. We have bone loss, and we have a lot. So I'm going to show you the steps I go through as BioExclude has allowed me to be more predictable in treating something that is hard to do. Remove all that granulation tissue. I love to use my... Um, titanium neutron tips and go around it over and over and over again because decontamination is so critical for us to save these implants. I'll then follow up with my titanium rotary bush, brushes here. And what happened is that when you do that, you'll see the titanium bristles become more frayed as you go around it over and over and over again. And they're single use, so you have to just end up buying more and more, which is why I have a lot here. So after it's been thoroughly decontaminated, I like to incorporate doxy slurry, which is just adding sterile saline to doxycycline. What's neat about um, BioExclude is that it has actually been shown in a study to be as effective as tetracycline against three bugs that are commonly found in the mouth, okay? And so it's really nice that beyond the decontamination that we have something antibacterial in there as well. So here's a bone graft in place. And here's my bioexclude. Now, I know you've seen it. You probably see it in the flyers. You see, heard me talk about it. You don't need to trim, but, you know, I decided to trim in this case, and I'll show you why. I got a 15 by 25. I got a 15 by 20. I trimmed a 15 by 25 into two pieces. I have that on the facial, and I have that part on the palatal, and that's what I'm going to put in approximately because I want to make sure that bone graft is fully covered by a barrier membrane. And it easily adapts. I mean, to get it in between teeth, so easy to do. Here we are, interop, or post, and then 14 months out, better soft tissue healing, healthier tissue, probing depths much improved, and we go from a situation that was a very bad one to a much better situation. 
And what was cool is on the CT scan where you could see we had bone all around that implant where prior to this we had bone loss circumferentially around this implant. Now, here's another case. Look at that exit date. This is my implant. Okay? I'm not going to go over the whole decontamination, but if you look back at this, um, I mean, I was begging this patient, let me explant this, let me start over, no charge, but I just, after two failed lapips, I just did not feel comfortable saving this. Patient said nope, so went ahead and treated this just like I did a prior case. The only thing I did differently was I, when I put biosolute and there's no need to do this, is I just wanted every edge I could have, and I do periosteal stabilizing sutures pretty much all the time. I mean, it's just when you do it over and over again, it's not that hard to do. But I stabilized it right there. And patient healed uneventfully throughout the process. And I took a random six-week um, CT scan just to see, hey, did I still have that graft contained in that area? Has it not moved, shifted, moved? I mean, I wanted to just double check. And what I love is one year out, we're in a much healthier situation, much better situation. So I placed this implant, I believe, in 2013. Up to 2017, it was looking fine. 2020, failed. Um, non-minimally invasive therapies, a big problem. And what you can see is the before and after on an implant that I wanted to remove. I don't mind being wrong here. The patient was right. Let's try to save it, and we did. Okay? Do we have bone all the way up, regenerated where we lost it? No. But this patient is certainly in a better place than she was in 2020. The only thing worse than a failing implant is when it actually fails. And this was a case in my, um, where the patient came in, we're going to um, put the scan body on, digital impression, so the dentist can restore it, the implant spun, instead of panicking, seriously, this took 10 minutes to do, okay? Just anesthetize, put in the bone graft, get in the bioslude, and like I've shown in many other cases, just reverse figure eight sutures, and we go from a bad situation, 10 minutes later, months later, to a situation where we are able to successfully manage a complication. So complications suck, but they're going to happen. You do enough procedures, you're going to have complications. And it's really important for us as clinicians, as providers, that we know how to manage them, whether they're ours or someone else's. Not putting this up here to brag, but... This is a reminder that, yes, I am a periodontist. So everything is focused on implant therapy. Let's shift a little bit uh, to a different topic on how do we save teeth. So let's go over what we call a GTR procedure here. Infrabony defect on the mesial of 18, crown lengthening done on number 19. That's why the crown's removed. Go ahead and get my bone graft in place, mostly cancellus, and I got my bioexclude here. And this is where bioexclude has a great advantage over a lot of other membranes is that it's really hard sometimes to get that membrane perfectly trimmed and in between teeth. But with this, it doesn't matter if it folds upon itself, hugs a tooth, it will just suck down and it'll cover everything. Okay, so try to make your life easier. I mean, that's what I try to do. So temporary crowns in place, five months out, bone is looking good, infrabony defect looks like it's filled on the mesial of number 18. And I was fortunate to have this patient come back after she had the final restoration. Probing depth's much improved, tissue tone is better, and we have good bone on the mesial of 18. So, again, just a very straightforward guided tissue regener uh, regeneration procedure. What does it look like was done here? To me, it looks like an FGG, one of my favorite procedures. Like Curry said, I love FGGs. What an FGG done here, okay? I did a GTR. I believe it was number 22 and 24 having these defects. Put my bone graft in place. Put my bioactive barrier membrane and bioexclude. Close it up. And we're never, ever going to argue against having good keratinized tissue. And I've seen this over and over and over again where you really get a positive effect on keratinized tissue using bioexclude. 
So my final case, okay, I won't keep you here forever, um, is the soft tissue application of it. This patient, I did a split mouth study design, did a chronally advanced flap only on the molar, connected tissue graft on the premolar, and bioexclude on the canine and on the lateral uh, chronally advanced flap using MDGAIN. So I like to keep things minimally invasive. Tunneling is probably one of my favorite things to do. Went ahead and slung this, um, the graft underneath, subperiosteally. Got MD gain on the lateral, and I got my bioexclude here, carry it dry, and it's very easy to tuck in. You have it fully tucked in using micro instruments, whatever you choose. I like to use a lot of the Pat Allen instruments, and I got my, my, my connected tissue graft in place, and I currently advance the tissue to go ahead and get this closed. So. Before and after we achieved root coverage, got thicker tissue, okay? I'm not saying go ahead and use bioexclude for every soft tissue grafting case. I just think it's nice to have another palate-free option available. But my recommendation, and this is just my professional opinion, is that if I am going to use bioexclude for some soft tissue augmentation, is that I want at least a one millimeter, two millimeter band of keratinized tissue and I prefer to have an adequate tissue thickness if I'm going to use it. Otherwise, I'm just going to go with my routine soft tissue grafting. So I choose bioexclude for these reasons here. And I think that you can see from the wide variety of cases I've shown that you can really have some true benefits in using this as it is a truly unique barrier membrane. It's a barrier and carrier all rolled into one product. So. Why is this here? I, my wife and I, we took so many um, fundamental and technical analysis of stocks um, to hopefully improve our trading. Um, I mean, I knew how to use a 20, 50, 200 day moving averages with the stochastics and MACD to, you know, see if I could, you know, get the right trade and be retired. But obviously that did not work. That's why I'm here still. Okay. And the reason why I show this is a lot of times I feel like I know things when I take a course and I try to bring it back and apply it to what, you know, I hope to achieve. And this reminds me that that's not always possible. Okay. But I promise you, if you follow some of the things that Dr. Levitt went over, some of the things I went over, and you just really pay attention to detail in your surgeries, document with photographs, all of that, that this is something that's very reproducible in your office. Okay, I mean, Dr. Lev and I showed a lot of different cases, and we're getting the same results, okay? And so, I close with this all the time. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Like Dr. Curry, and I'm so lucky with social media. I mean, probably the biggest thing I'm thankful for is just meeting such good people and friends like Dr. Levitt and many others. But I'm pretty active on social media. If you like the cases you see today, you know, please give a follow. I try to share cases as much as possible, but be warned that uh, you will see random stuff like sushi and my dog and my family and kids. I just go all over the place with my ADHD. I hope that if you're going to be at the AEP um, in Austin that you could join us. I think we're going to have a very um, fun session where you could learn a lot. It's going to be with this group here, my boys. And so I hope to see you there. I want to thank you all for your time.